Appreciate that, Brother Jerry. We're going to be taking our Bibles to the book of 1 Thessalonians, chapter number 4 today. 1 Thessalonians, chapter number 4 in the Bible. And what a blessing it is to be able to open these pages. Also great to have the Reno family here with us today. What a blessing they, that is. They went to school with us when we were in high school and junior high and all those things. It's great to have them from Albany with us today. What a blessing that is to me. Uh, there are a lot of wonderful events that captivate us. Not only are there wonderful events that captivate us, there's also tragic events that captivate us. Just a moment in time where our senses are uh, captured, where the event is then at that point etched into our mind forever. Uh, many of you sitting here today remember those global events where history was shifted. Uh, how many here remembers the day that man stepped foot on the moon for the first time? How many remembers what you were doing, where you were at? Okay, very good. That ages a lot of you, okay? I can't remember that, okay? But there's many of you all who cannot remember what you had for breakfast, but you can remember that event, where you were at, what you were doing, what you were eating, and who you were talking to. And that's how it works. For us, the millennial generation, that was 9-11. Uh, many of us think of, uh, generationally, we think of the millennials as teenagers, but that's not how that works, okay? Uh, the millennials were teenagers 20 years ago. <laughs> Uh, uh, the generation experts say that a millennial is somewhere around 1981 to about 1995. And they say the cutoff for a millennial is those who can remember 9-11. If you can't remember it, then you're in the next generation, what we consider Generation Z. And so the generational experts say that that 9-11, now I remember where I was at at 9-11. I was at uh, Clinton County High School in gym class my freshman year, sweating and about to go to English class. Now that tells you how young I am, okay? I just saw some ladies with their mouth drop open when I said that. Freshman class is where I was at when 9-11 happened. And uh, I can remember it like it was yesterday. I remember who talked to me. I was leaving gym class. Charlie uh, came out afterwards and said, hey, do you, did you hear about two, uh, two plans? or a plane crashing into a, a building. I thought he meant like a two-seater plane in like a small town in Podunk, Kentucky. That's what I thought. But it was totally different. We went to English class and we saw that second plane uh, fly into. How many remembers watching that event happen? And you'll always remember that. It sets into your mind. You always can, can bring it back up. Now, those are what I'm talking about. Moments in history where it just seems to connect. For many of us who are parents, if you are a parent, and that captivating moment was at the birth of your child. What a very amazing and excruciating time at the same time, right? Talk about uh, paradox moments. It's the worst pain you've ever been in and the greatest joy you've ever had at the same time. That's what the birth of your child was like. It's a time when you're watching this living person uh, coming out of a womb and breathing for the first time. But what you do not realize in the hospital room is that the hardest days are now in front of you, okay? You're sitting there, you're sleep deprived, you have all these things going on where you don't know how you're gonna make this baby come out and all these things, but what you just didn't realize is that the hardest days are in front of you from that point forward because now you have to train them and teach them and help them uh, to learn and educate themselves. Now, it's gonna take a long time to develop this child into a mature adult. Now, how many knows a grown man that acts like a child? Anybody know anybody like that? Okay, very good, very good. They miss some of the developmental processes when they was a child. What happens is when we are growing babies into adults, we not only focus on the physical, but we also focus on the social. We try to develop them educationally and spiritually and morally. And this process advances at different speeds for different people. We was talking to someone the other day and uh, Magnolia has now made that transition where me and Gayla cannot spell in the car because she can sound it out now. How many remembers those days? Like, that's scary. Like, we're having a private conversation now that a little five-year-old girl is in the process of understanding this conversation. We'll drive down the street and she'll read road signs that I can't even pronounce. And uh, someone was asking me about it the other day. She said, they said, it seems like she's developing pretty quickly in that. I said, you wouldn't even believe it. At about three and a half years old, she picked up a chapter book and started reading verses out of the chapter book. Just automatically. Did that how it happened? 
No, okay, that don't happen. That doesn't happen. What happened is her mother was very patient and persistent with her in trying to develop that and teach her to read. And I want to tell you, that was a very hard and excruciating process in just trying to teach her how to read. Because how many knows that a four-year-old wants to eat candy and play games all day? Anybody understand that? Right. And that's what she wanted to do. But her mother was very patient with her. Her mother was very persistent with her. We read Sea Spot Run 75,000 times. And now she can read. She's doing well with that. But it took a process of developing. Now, we think about that in our mind when it comes to our children or our aunt or our nieces or nephews. We think about that with our grandchildren, how they have to have this process of developing into a mature adult. But I want you to think about God's children. Think for a moment about the spiritual maturity of God's people. Now we understand that when the Bible is talking about salvation, Jesus uses this term. He says, you must be born again. Now, a person that comes to know Christ as their Savior, they receive Him to be their propitiation for sin. They ask Him uh, in faith to forgive them, give them a home in heaven, a relationship with God. Listen, that person may be 42 years old physically, but at that moment, spiritually, they are a newborn babe in Christ. The Bible teaches us that just like a child, a baby, uh, desires the milk of his mother, also a newborn Christian in Christ, a newborn babe in Christ is what the scripture calls. Desires the sincere milk of the word of God that it might grow thereby. You say, Pastor, what is that process called? It's called a word named sanctification. Sanctification. We have turned this morning to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4 to look at this growth of the believer. To find out what is this thing, how do we develop as a child develops into a, uh, an adding to society adult. How do we as Christians uh, develop and uh, grow into one who adds to the church and adds to the kingdom of God and is a, uh, a good part of the spiritual body of Christ? How do we grow from a babe in Christ to a godly man, woman, boy, girl in the Lord Jesus Christ spiritually? Well, we find 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, look at verse number 1. The Bible says, For, Furthermore, then we beseech you, Brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. For ye know what commandment uh, we gave you by the Lord Jesus, that this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor." Now, in your mind, I want you to look at these verses, look at these sentences, look at these words as you sitting down on a couch when you've messed up at six years old and your daddy sitting you down on that couch and with his finger, he says, now I got some things to tell you, okay? I want you to mind, be mindful of that and think about what God is saying here. How many has a parent ever said, okay, here's what I want you to learn. And furthermore, does anybody ever remember that furthermore word? <laughs> Okay, in addition to all these things, here's what I want you to hear is what he's saying. Notice how our verse begins in verse number one. He says, furthermore. Now listen, I've been telling you a lot of things, but here's something extremely important for you to learn. Furthermore, we beseech you, brethren, the child of God, we exhort you, encourage you in Jesus Christ, that as you have received, ought ye to walk. The commandments that we've given you, the way that you should live, that that should be personal in your life, that you would take those principles and grow thereby. That process is called sanctification. With the help of the Lord, I want to preach on this subject this morning, the P's of sanctification. The P's of sanctification. Let's pray and ask God's blessings on the service today. Lord God, we are grateful, Lord, for each who have gathered here. Man, my heart swells with the friends and the family that are in this room. God, I am unworthy to know and love so many people who are just good, faithful, godly, helpful brothers and sisters in Christ and family. God, it is, it's, a, it's a reward, Lord, to simply come to church to see 
the great and wonderful blessings that you've given to this church, which are not our possessions. God, that the greatest blessings in our, in our life is not the money that you've allowed this church to save for the furtherance of the kingdom of God. God, the greatest blessings are filling these seats today. God, the greatest blessings are those who are in the nursery and in super church and toddler class as, as we speak. God, we're thankful for each other. But God, even more important than each other, we're thankful for the word of God. And Lord, we've come here with a desire to learn. And so God, I pray that every person would think individually today. May we not think about what our neighbor needs or what our family member needs. But God, may we come today as we enter into 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and find specifically what it is that I need. God, I'm thankful that you've taught me some lessons from this passage just this last few days. But God, I pray that this week would be a time where we all take to simply focus on this truth, this biblical truth called sanctification. For it's in the name of Jesus that we pray, amen and amen. Now, again, the word sanctification simply means to be clean uh, and to be set apart, sanctified, set apart for uh, the, the master's use or for use. Specifically, we're speaking here about uh, spiritual sanctification. We're talking spe- specifically here about uh, having this uh, time in our life where we are growing in godliness unto the Lord Jesus. And that is a very important process in our lives because we all understand that we all want things that are clean to be able to use them for our purposes. Now, let me ask you a question. This is going to be a very intrusive question that I'm going to ask you to be honest with me about. How many has ever had dishes set in your sink for two or three days? Anybody ever been there? How many's ever had a set in there for a week or longer? Anybody been there? Okay, okay. A couple of us have, okay? We, we understand that. But now you have to eat today and you have this great, wonderful supper that you have prepared So do you go to the sink and grab one of those dirty dishes out and then put your new supper right on top of it? Is that how you do it? No way. You would never do that. You would go get a clean plate and you would use it for your purposes. And that's much how God will will use. And it is that process of sanctification that cleanses us from sin, that works out the impurities in our life. And it is a very crucial part of every believer is that we allow the process of sanctification to work in us that we might be able to be used for God and for his glory. Now, please understand this. You may want to write this down because this is something that we all need to know. Please understand that salvation like birth is a miracle of the moment. Salvation like birth is a miracle at at an instant moment that is born. But sanctification like growth is a process of a lifetime. Listen, we're never in this world going to be perfectly sinless. But we are in this process of sanctification that we might sin less and less. And that is called sanctification. So I want us to notice five very brief things this morning about the P's of sanctification that we all need to know to make sure that they are working active in our life, but also in our mind as we are processing this. How do I live godly today? Number one, I want you to understand first, sanctification is a privilege. Okay. Sanctification is a privilege. Look with me if you would in verse number three. For this is the will of God. Do you notice what he's saying there? He is saying sanctification is the will of God in your life. Now, many people think of this word sanctification as a dirty word that legalistic people get up and scream and shout about. But quite the contrary, sanctification is a beautiful word that God uses in great grace and mercy that we might be able to work out those old imperfections and sins in our life that we might be able to use in the will of God. And I want to tell you, when God who formed the world, the Bible says that he spoke the universes into existence, the psalmist will say that he took the water in the palm of his hand and poured out the rivers and the oceans into the palm of his hand. He's the one that formed the mountains. When we think about the great wonders and glory of who God is, to know that he would decide to choose to use me and you, you want to know what that is? That's a, that's a privilege. That's an honor. That is something that we cannot get over, mind-boggling and numbing to understand that God has a perfect will for you. Think about this. 
the one who created everything, the world and all that is therein, has a specific purpose for you. Now, I'm going to tell you, in a world of nearly 8 billion people, to know the God of heaven has a specific purpose for my life, that is a, a wonderful, wonderful privilege. The Bible says in Jeremiah chapter number 1 and verse number 5, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Before thou camest forth of the womb, I sanctified thee. I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. And may I say, just like God had a plan for Jeremiah's life, God has a tremendous plan for your life. I'm going to tell you, that beats anything that MIT can give you, okay? That beats anything that a ball field can provide for you. When Jesus, when God, the Father, specifically has a purpose and plan for you, that is amazing. I want you to think for a moment about the time that Jesus entered into Jerusalem <clears throat> during his triumphant entry. So he is uh, riding upon a beast of burden. Does anybody remember what that beast was? What was it? Somebody help me out this morning. He's riding upon a, a donkey, a colt, an ass. What the Bible shows us there is he is riding upon this donkey and he's going into Jerusalem. He's entering the gates, but as he is riding upon this, this donkey, the, the Bible tells us that they are throwing certain things in his way. Now, what are those things? Anybody, anybody help me out with that one? Somebody help me? Palm leaves. Very good. They are throwing palm leaves into his way that he might be able to be honored as he is tr- uh, progressing in this journey. But not only is it palm leaves, there's something else that he, they are throwing in his way. Anybody remember what those are? Yes, they're coats, they're outer garments. They're throwing them in the way. They're saying, listen, what God is doing here in this moment is so much uh, more important than even uh, the, the necessities of my life. This outer coat, they're throwing them in the way. But even more than what they're doing is what they're saying. Does anybody remember what they're shouting? Oh man, they're shouting, Hosannas, Hosannas. One of the gospel writers will say that They are saying, blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And when they start saying those things, the religious crowd get really, really mad. Anybody ever saw a religious person get really, really mad? Yes, horns come out and fire comes out of their mouth. You know what I'm talking about? Well, that's what the Pharisees were doing in that day. They were extremely mad at what God was doing in this process, but it was the perfect will of God that had been established before the world had been established. That he was going to ride upon that donkey into that place and they were going to be screaming, blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. That was established before the foundations of the world was established. Pharisees didn't like it. You know what they asked Jesus to do? He, they said, won't you, won't you hush those people up? Why why don't you take them and and shut their mouth? Tell them that they shouldn't be saying those things. Remember what Jesus tells them? If they withheld what they were saying, the rocks would cry out, Hosannas. I'm going to tell you, that is who God is. He can use the rocks, the trees, the wind, the dust of the earth. He can use anything he wants to get the glory But you know what he chooses to do? He chooses to use dirt bags like you and me to get the glory. And all of God's people said, amen. Amen. You know what that is? It's a privilege. Sanctification isn't a dirty word. Sanctification is a privilege that I could live a life where God would say, I'm using you for my glory. Number two, not only sanctification is a privilege, but number two, sanctification has a purpose. There is a great purpose to this process of sanctification in your life and in my life. We see here in verse number four, some great truth. The Bible says that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. You may have worked at a a place for some time. And has anybody ever been in the process of training new people? 
I'm going to tell you, that is gruesome and hard work, isn't it? You're training these people. They've never done this before. And man, they, uh, you're, you're trying to teach them all these things to do. Uh, why? Because there is a, a great purpose for what they are doing if they will simply learn it. Notice what the Bible says in verse number four, that a child of God, one who has come to know him as their personal savior, uh, they should also know how to handle, possess his vessel in sanctification and in honor. He's talking about there is a great purpose to this that we might know who we are and how to handle ourselves. Now, I want to tell you, if, if you kick the person in the backside who is causing you the most problems in life, you wouldn't be able to sit down for a while, okay? Because it would be you who you're kicking. And we see that and we understand that truth. And what we find here is that our bodies were made for a purpose. And it's not just a, a purpose for fleshly lust. I would be... Safe to say in the service today and in the service this morning and across churches around the globe today, there are people who have predominantly used this past week for their own pleasures. Predominantly used this past week for their own sin. They have done things to be able to get to a place where they can sin against God. I'm going to tell you. Jesus here in verse number four is saying, listen, sanctification is a privilege, but I want to tell you, sanctification has a product and it's trying to work those things out of you. And in that understanding, there's for every one of us specific sins that we all fall short of. Remember when Paul was speaking, he said, lay down the weights and the sins that so easily beset you. Do you realize that there's a sin that I have, there's a sin that you have that we deal with more than any other sin? How, do we have any ice cream lovers here today? I could eat ice cream for breakfast, brunch, lunch, lupper, and supper. And the reason why I look the way I, like, I look is because I like ice cream. I've told you this before. There's an old saying. It says, ice cream, you scream. We all scream for ice cream. But ice cream always screams for Tommy. I'll walk down the aisle there at, at Walmart and I'll hear it coming out of the glass doors. And that's, that, that's my, the, I, man, I'm pulled to that. Now, how many like strawberry over chocolate? Oh, praise the Lord. Now, how many likes vanilla over both of them? Lord, pray for them and help them and their plain taste buds, okay? I like double strawberry. If you can put more strawberries in it, put them in there. I love strawberry ice cream. But you don't maybe like uh, strawberry ice cream. Maybe you like chocolate or maybe you like vanilla. But listen, your body was made for more than sin and ice cream, okay? And although we are pulled in different directions by different sins, God says, listen, sanctification needs to work out this uh, purpose in your life to get you over those things because you were made for more than those you were made for more than that. God has a different purpose for your life. He created you to be used in his glory and his honor. Now, I'm going to ask you a personal question. A personal question is this. Have you ever sinned against God and after you sinned against God, you felt like the world's worst person? Yeah. Have you ever felt that way? You ever stepped outside of what you should have done and did something wrong and you thought to yourself, man, I don't know how in the world God can forgive me from this again. I, I hate that I've done that. Have you ever felt depressed and discouraged because of sin? You say, preacher, why, why do I feel that way? Well, there's two reasons. Number one, because you're a child of God and God chasteneth every child that he loves. Now, chasteneth is that process of getting spankings, okay? And going out to the woodshed, as many would say, or going out to pick your own switch. Those, that's that process. That is that. Well, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter number 12, verse number 6 and through verse number 8, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as, as he does with the son. Uh, for what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? Now notice verse number 8. But if ye be without chastisement, Whereof all are partakers, all of God's children are partakers, then ye are bastards and not sons. You know what the Bible teaches us there? If we sin and sin and sin and sin and never get convicted about it, it's probably the truth that you've never been regenerated in your heart. If you sin and sin and sin and sin and say, praise God, I feel great. Well, listen, you probably have never been saved. Because the Bible says if you are sinning and you are a child of God, 
then you're going to the woodshed about every evening. Okay? That's what the Bible is showing us there. And whom he doesn't chasten, there's no scourging or there's no sonship. But then the second reason, not only because we are a child of God and because of that chastisement comes, but naturally I believe the second reason that we feel depressed after we sinned is because our spirit and our mind that have been bought and purchased with the Lord from the Lord, that when we sin, it groaneth against those things. Now, when God created Adam and Eve in the beginning, he created them perfect. He was a perfect man. She was a perfect woman. There was nothing of sin in there. God created no sin. But also when God created the earth, he created it perfect. Remember that they were in paradise. They didn't have to go out under their own strength and till the ground or turn the soil. They didn't have to go out and plant vineyards or any of those things. They didn't have to go pull weeds. Can you imagine a world without weeds? Listen, we're growing them around here. And if you leave here today and you see a weed, pick it up and take it home with you, okay? Do that for me. But this was a world without thistles, without thorns, without weeds. But when, God, when man sinned in the garden, curse fell upon man and curse fell upon this earth. And now the Bible teaches us in Romans chapter number 8, verses number, uh, verses number 19 through verse number 22. That now because of that, the, the creation groaneth together waiting on the manifestation of the sons of God. You know what the Bible teaches us there? That this world is groaning for perfection. Why? Because it was made for more than what it's doing. And when we as God's children will decide and choose to live rather in sin than in the process of sanctification, our body our mind, our spirit is groaning because we were made for more than that. And that's why many live in a state of depression because they will continually live in sin and not allow God to have that process of sanctification in them. Hey, listen, you want to have victory over a depressed and discouraged nature? then allow God to start cleaning you up in the process of sanctification. There are some sins that you need to get over. There are some things in your life that is not pleasing to God that you need to get through and past. And God is saying that sanctification is a, it, it is, there is a product. Number, number three, would you write this down? Sanctification is a process. <laughs> Woo! It's a process. Just like we understood at the earlier statement that salvation is a miracle of the moment, uh, but, but sanctification is a, a, a learning that never stops. It is a process that never ends until we all get to heaven. Uh, I want you to notice what the Bible says in verse number three. For this is the will of God. What is the will of God? Your sanctification. That ye should abstain from and now fill in the blank. Okay. The Bible here puts fornication. Okay, that is the blank that some of us needs to, to, to say, hey, I want to get this out of my life. But your blank might be something else. We could, without hurting the truth of application here of the text, we could put any sin that you have that you're dealing with, you could put it straight right in the verse. You could label it just sin because it doesn't hurt the application and understanding what the verse is saying, that the process of sanctification is that we not necessarily become sinless, but that we, become, we sin less and less abstaining from sin that draws us particularly. But let me tell each of you the truth that you already know. That is a long and sometimes gruesome process. It doesn't just happen overnight, okay? I believe with all of my heart that when a person comes to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, how many remembers that moment? I was a young man at that time. And I came and I received the Lord Jesus as my Savior. I, I prayed and asked Him to forgive me of my sin and give me a home in heaven. And I, I, I stood up. There was a sin in my life at that time. I'm not going to talk about it or discuss it, but there was a sin in my life at that time that I was uh, very much uh, doing uh, repetitively, and it was a habitual sin. And I got up from that altar at the age of seven. I turned around. I shook the whole church's hand because that's what they did in that time. Remember the receiving lines at salvation? That was how I, when it, what happened when I got saved. And I shook everybody's hand. I didn't know anything about COVID. <laughs> went like that and all those kind of things. And uh, I went home and I didn't do that sin. 
that day. I woke up the next day and didn't do that sin the next day. I woke up that next day and I didn't do that sin the next day. And it has been a long time, 28 years, and I have not since that moment done that sin. I believe when you are saved at that moment, God gives you the power to have victory over sin that you never go to again. I know the same people that says the same thing about drinking. I've heard the same people say the same thing about smoking. I've heard a lot of people say the same things about different sins. That when they got up from the altar, it was, it was, they was delivered from that, that temptation. Now, I'm going to tell you, there's other sins that I've dealt with for a long time. Anybody say amen to that one? Amen. And the process of sanctification is allowing that and pulling that out. And sometimes those sins that we are dealing with is like potty training. How many has ever tried to potty train a child? I mean, when that four-year-old, that father takes him in the bathroom. Let me rephrase that. When that mother takes him in the bathroom to potty train him. And they're going through that process. Sometimes it's a very stinky and messy process. And just like working sin out of our life with the Holy Spirit of God's help and the church's help and the God's, God's word's help, sometimes it's a stinky and very messy process. And sometimes we, we fight against it. Did anybody ever have a child that fought against potty training? Yeah. It's like, what are you thinking? <laughs> you want to be a mature adult, but if you're ever going to do this, you're going to have to learn how to use the restroom. And they're fighting against it. They don't want it. They don't want it. They don't want it. Man, I don't want to do this. This, this process is horrible. And then they finally get potty trained. And they're like, yes, I'm so excited. You know, I'll never go back to that again. And that's how they think. Well, there's a lot of people today who are fighting against the process because they don't want to give their sin up. And man, they're saying, I don't want that. I, I, I couldn't imagine life without that sin. And man, life would be horrible without me doing that or going there or saying those things. It, life would be just different. I don't even think I'd want to until you finally quit kicking against the pricks and you finally understand the process of sanctification. Then you're going to be like, yes, I never want to go back to doing those things again. You know what it is? Sanctification is a privilege. Sanctification has a product and sanctification is a process. Yeah, that's good. And if you allow God to work in you that process of sanctification, you're going to turn around in five years and you're going to say, man, I wish I'd done that 10 years ago. Process of sanctification. Turn with me really quickly to 2 Peter chapter number one. Hold your spot there in 1 Thessalonians. We're coming right back. I only have about 40 more minutes of the message, so just hold on to it if you would really quickly. 2 Peter chapter number one, verse number five. Oh, Peter and Paul, you know, we started out 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 with the word furthermore. And then we come to 2 Peter chapter number 1 and verse number 5 and we, sides, we see this, this phrase, and besides this, you know what he's saying? Furthermore. <laughs> let, me, let me give you some more important information he says. Giving all diligence. Now be very diligent in understanding what this is showing us. Be diligent in making sure that this is a process. Well, notice what he says. Add to your faith. What is the building block? What is the foundation of our salvation? What is the foundation of our relationship with the Lord? Uh, it is faith. For by grace are you saved through faith. Faith is that fundamental process by which we are saved. It is faith. But then he says, I want you to add to your faith. What is he saying? I want you to grow up. Notice what he's saying. Is he's saying, Add to your faith virtue, and virtue knowledge, and knowledge temperance, and temperance, add to it patience, <laughs> and patience godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness charity. Every one of us is on that stair step somewhere. You're either still at the, the base level of faith and trying to take the step of virtue or man, you've already graduated through brotherly kindness and now you're trying to add to your faith charity. 
Every one of us is on that somewhere, that process of sanctification. How, pastor, do I then learn knowledge? How do I, how do I add to my faith virtue? How do I add to my brotherly kindness charity? How do I get to the next step? Well, there is this process. Very quickly, I want you to notice five things. Five things, really quickly. Would you write these th things down? I want to be very quick through these. Number one, how do I be sanctified? How, how do I... Uh, Get into the process of sanctification. Number one, by the word of God. Amen. By the word of God. The Bible says John, Jesus is praying in John 17, 17. Here's what he says. He says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Listen, if you are not daily in the word of God, you have pressed the pause or maybe the stop button of sanctification in your life. Because if you are not in the word of God daily, then you are daily not being sanctified. The word of God is that which cleanses us. We'll learn, we'll learn that in the book of Titus, how with the washing regeneration by the spirit, with the word of God, it cleanses us from these sins. Being able to be in the word of God. Really quickly, I'm spending way too much time. Number two, by other Christians. We can be sanctified in the process and helped in the process of sanctification by other godly Christians. Now, not those ones that look down their nose at you, but those who come beside you holding your hand and trying to help you with learn some things. The Bible says in Colossians 3, 16, for let the word of God dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart, one uh, for win with another to the Lord. And what he's showing us there is that we as Christians come alongside each other to help encourage each other in the Lord and to help the process of sanctification. Listen, if you've ever had a child of God come up to you, a brother and sister in Christ and say, listen, I see some things in your life that I think you need to be a little cautious of. And here's some scripture that I believe will help you. Never look at that person and say, ha, who are you? Always say, thank you. And allow that to have the process of sanctification. Number three, by a daily relationship with Christ. I don't have time to read it. You'll have to read it at home. John 15, verses three through verse number four, tells us about that relationship with Christ and how it, sanctifies, or how it is in the process of sanctification. Number four, by the indwelling Holy Spirit. How can we be in the process of sanctification? What is it that we need to do? You need to allow yourself to surrender and submit to that inner voice of the Holy Spirit of God. I guarantee you, there's been times in your life when you have been tempted to go towards a sin and you heard that still small voice in your heart that says, you better not do that. Hey. Let me ask you a question. Did you listen? Did you listen? The process of sanctification is when we do listen. There's probably been times in your life when you've been tempted to sin and, and that still small voice in your heart says to yourself, listen, if you'll turn away right now, you don't have to get, you don't have to get messed up in that sin today. You can have victory over that sin today if you will simply turn around right now. I'm giving you a way of escape. You've probably been there. There's been times when you've said yes to it and there's probably been times when you've said no to it. But what that is, is that is the process of sanctification if we will simply listen to it. What verse is that? 2 Corinthians 3.18. 2 Corinthians 3.18. Fifthly, by our own commitments. 2 Timothy chapter number 2, verse number 21. If a man therefore purge himself from these he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. Number four, sanctification has a product. There's a product that happens in the life of those who allow God to work in them, to cleanse them of sin, to empty them of self and to fill them with the spirit of God. It's found in verse number one. I want you to notice the product. Furthermore, when we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you have received of us how you ought to walk, and when we walk in those things, when we are living a godly life, when we are in the process of sanctification, notice what happens, that conjunction, and, and to what? Please God. You know what sanctification does in our life? It pleases God. Amen. Just the other day, I was sitting down with several people throughout the week, and Many were talking about some issues that were going on in our life and we were talking about some things and I would sit down with them and we would be on a good subject and then they would veer off subject and talk about their children. Anybody ever found somebody that just wants to talk about their children? Anybody ever been there? You, have you ever talked to me? You'll find it true of me. I was talking to somebody the other day. I was talking about Magnolia and they was like. <laughs> and I talked and talked and talked and talked. That's, that, that is something special when a child that you raise goes off to do something wonderful. 
becomes a great part of society, becomes very, um, I don't know how to say this, but uh, just a good uh, man or lady to the society that's around them. Godly people. And what happens is when that happens, all you want to do is brag on them. You just want to talk about them. You just want to speak about it. You want to tell everybody about what they're doing. That's special. That you're filled with, you're filled with pride because of the decisions that they're making. Let me tell you what happens. When we decide to live a sanctified life, cleansing ourselves from our old ways and living unto God, I'm going to tell you what happens. We please and put a smile on the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. He finds pride and seeing his children walk in his ways. That's what the Bible tells us. But not only is that a great product in eternity, but it's a great product now. The Bible says in the latter part of that verse, so would you abound more and more. Anybody want to volunteer for the abounding more and more category? How does that work? Well, it works when you get out from under the getting of the whoopings of God <laughs> and stepped into the getting the blessings of God, Right? There's probably been children in your, your days that have made that transition to where you don't have to whoop them anymore. And now you just give them the car keys at any time because you can trust them. The process of sanctification is just like that with God. It not only pleases Him, but it pours blessings upon those who will uh, submit themselves to that process. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 4, 8, I'm going to ask you all to be my witness here. Okay, are you ready? 1 Timothy 4, 8. For bodily exerciseth profiteth little. And all God's people said, Amen. Thank you. For bodily exerciseth profiteth little. You know what that verse means? It doesn't mean that bodily exercise is bad. What it means is that it doesn't do very much profit. In the aspect of you have to do it today and tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next week and the next month and the next month and the next year. And when you stop, guess what? It all goes away. <laughs> How many's ever been there? Lose 20 to gain 40, right? We don't know why. First Timothy chapter four, verse number eight. <laughs> Bodily exercise, profit little. If you're going to keep it, you got to do it. But notice the conjunction. And not only is this conjunction that takes two sentences together, but it is but, the word is but, so it's saying, but there's a contrast to this. Bodily exercise, profit little. But notice the next word, godliness is profitable unto all things having promise of the life that is now and of that which is to come. You know what sanctification produces in our life? Blessings now and later. Blessings now and later. Number five, and we'll be done very quickly. I want you to notice sanctification has a person. A person. In closing, I want to read verses one through four again. And every time I pause... I want you to read the next word, okay? And out loud, by the time we're over, everybody's going to get the hint, okay? And, and you're going to be on it. But I'm going to ask you, when I pause, you say the next word. Are you ready? Verse number one. And furthermore, then we beseech brethren and exhort by the Lord Jesus that as have received of us how ought to walk and to please God, so would abound more and more. For know what commandment we gave by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even sanctification that should abstain from fornication, that every one of should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Let me ask you a question. Who's the person of sanctification? <laughs> you. <laughs> and me. Yeah, right, right. It's you and it's, it's me. You know what sanctification is about? It's not necessarily about what your neighbor's doing. It's about what you're doing. It's easy for us as Christians, especially of those who've been Christians for a long time, to look down on someone else because they are not maturing at the rate that they are. Wouldn't that be a sad thing physically? Wouldn't it be like a seventh grade year of looking down on somebody because they're not maturing physically like you're maturing? We have some issues with Nathaniel now. You saw that go out in, our tech, in the, the prayer chain. Because he's so far behind developmentally, they think that he may have cerebral palsy or some other things going on. Wouldn't it be a shame for a three-year-old to look at 
Nathaniel and, and look down on them because he's not maturing like, like he should maturing. Then why spiritually do we have the stick to beat everybody else up because they're not maturing at the same speed that everybody else is maturing? What they need is a friend, not a foe. What they need is a, is a, is a culture of help instead of a culture of criticism. Someone to help bring them along. Listen, I don't care who you are, where you're from, what you've done, or what your daddy did. Every one of us is in a process of sanctification. Hey. I want to I give a newsflash. Here we go. Newsflash. Dee, 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 dee. None of us have arrived. Yeah. None of us have arrived. And every one of us is in a process of sanctification. Therefore, we don't look down on everybody else. We say, hey, where am I at on the list? Am I at faith? Am I at virtue? Am I at understanding? Am I at brotherly kindness? Where am I at on that list and how do I get to the next step? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Would you stand with me this morning?